Hello, I'm Darren Jordan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, cracks in the global economy. Stocks soar to record highs despite the coronavirus pandemic. Billionaires become richer, but the poor get poorer. So, is it time to finally confront capitalism? Remaking China and the world in President Xi's image, is the Middle Kingdom looking inwards as the chill of a new Cold War threatens the factory of the world? And global debt soars as governments spend, spend, spend. Can the world cope with even more debt? Well, no nation has been spared from the coronavirus pandemic. With 22 million cases and almost 800,000 deaths, the health crisis is far from over as secondary spikes flare up. We may have seen some of the worst economic costs, but more pain could be lurking as we head into the final few months of the year. Well, most of the industrialised world has delivered on its second quarter GDP numbers, and the worst performer was Boris Johnson's Britain. Its economy contracted more than a fifth after failing to lock down early enough. The country also has the most deaths in Europe. While the unemployment rate has yet to reflect the severity of the economic crisis, it's only a matter of time when furlough schemes across Europe come to an end. In the United States, more than 20 million people lost their jobs before a stuttering recovery began. In the developing world, those in the informal economy were the worst affected, with more than 120 million day labourers losing their jobs in India. Well, against this backdrop, the United States and China have inched towards a new Cold War. President Trump is taking aim at China's Hong Kong security law, the internment of millions of Uyghurs and technology companies that are seen as a security threat. President Xi has extended his control inside China and has taken a more aggressive, expansive approach, high in the Himalayas on the disputed border with India and across the South China Sea. So let's take some of those issues and put them into our expert panel and see what's in store for the rest of the year. Well, joining me from London is Bilal Hafiz, CEO of Microhive. And from Singapore via Skype is Rajiv Biswas. Rajiv is the Executive Director and Asia Pacific Chief Economist at IHS Market. And from London is Robert Quartley Janeiro. Robert is visiting fellow at the Hellenic Observatory with the London School of Economics. Uh, Rajiv, let me start with you first, if I may. So what are we then to make uh, of the recovery in China? What are we seeing and what are we not seeing? Because there appears to be this build-up of supply, factories are humming, but consumers are not spending. Well, the Chinese economy has rebounded very well from the shutdown that happened back in uh, February at the peak of the pandemic in China. And we've seen industrial production actually coming back to pretty much normal levels and actually growing compared to pre-pandemic output levels. Uh, and on the consumer side, uh, activity is also normalized to a large extent. Uh, it's almost back to the pre-pandemic levels of retail sales. However, some sectors are still lagging. Clearly, tourism still is very much impacted. And also the airline industry, uh, commercial travel is still below the levels of pre-pandemic. But I think when we look at China's economy today, it's really probably leading the global recovery out of the pandemic. Um, Robert, let's bring you in here and talk about the geopolitical situation, starting with that relationship between the United States and China. Let me ask you, is this a new Cold War and what does it mean for trade? It, it certainly looks like a, a new Cold War, Dan. And I think if you, and that's across a number of areas, that's across diplomacy, human rights, trade. Uh, for the US, the US has, has to deal with a huge trade deficit with China, of about $420 billion. It can use that money to refocus efforts and trade relationships elsewhere. So you saw Apple recently move some production to India. There's opportunities to things with Malaysia and Vietnam. Uh, the Chinese also hold 4% of outstanding US treasuries, about one, one trillion. And the US really needs to, in the long term, uh, stop China having having those T-bills available to them. It needs to bleed them off them. Uh, it, we've also seen recently the way that uh, Chinese firms will no longer be able to list on US stock exchanges, which was a part of a documentary called The China Hustle. Uh, and then lastly, the availability of uh, things like we, we 
sorry, the things like TikTok and um, WeChat in, in in the US are going to be stopped unless they're owned by US uh, companies. So it's a it's a big play. Uh, I would say it's a, a real economic cold war at this moment, and that's what it needs to be. Uh, it's an economic cold war, so that it's not a military war, um, and that's what the US can play with. And there's also bipartisan support for it. So whether Joe Biden wins the next election or not, or whether Donald Trump stays in as president, there's bipartisan cross-party support for a tougher line on China. Um, Bilal, let's bring you in here, because purely on an economic basis, I mean, why would China be pushing a more expansive approach, a more confrontational approach with its neighbours? I mean, is China feeling uh, stronger, more emboldened, perhaps? Yes, I, I do think there is a, a big element of that. I think under President Xi, the regime there has become more authoritative and more concerned with projecting power. I think also there's an issue around the US starting to withdraw from the global stage, which then allows China to be more expansive in its neighboring countries. Uh, and then also there's a, an economic uh, aspect to all of this, where China does also want to consolidate its uh, economic relationships uh, across Asia, uh, again, in response to some of the, uh, the threats from the US as well. Um, Rajiv, uh, so who's done the best job then of handling the crisis uh, in the Asia-Pacific region? I mean, is it New Zealand, Vietnam or South Korea? Well, as I mentioned, China's leading the recovery if we look at a global level. And in the cases of uh, Vietnam, uh, New Zealand and South Korea, they had been doing very well until basically just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they had managed to control their cases to very, very low levels. In the case of New Zealand and Vietnam, they had three months straight with no cases. But unfortunately, it's all come unwound in the last couple of weeks with an upsurge of cases in all of those three countries. So although the case levels are still relatively low compared to their population, it does show that you are getting these second waves springing up across the region. But at an economic level, there has been quite a good rebound across the region. Most of the countries in the Asia Pacific have shown quite a rebound during June and July as lockdowns have been uh, lifted and as some of the restrictions in terms of movement and consumer activity have been slowly relaxed. So at an economic level, there's improvement, but there's this ongoing concern about the impact of second waves that are hitting a number of the countries in the Asia region. Uh, and, Robert, every time we have a crisis, we always talk about the remaking of capitalism or the economy. I mean, will things change? Will things change is uh, open for debate. We certainly need things to change. Uh, you know, the last three or four economic recessions, you know, they end and then we move back into a new business cycle and people sort of forget about it. Uh, I think this time you know, what we need is, is higher wages, we need some inflation, we need sustainable business models. Uh, and people need jobs. Yeah, there's, there's a huge lack of jobs. Before this crisis, there were millions and millions of people out of work. So, yeah, there, there's more to be done. Uh, and we have to move forward in a way that's positive. Uh, whether what, that will happen, yeah, that's much harder to say. Bill, let me bring you back uh, into, the, into the discussion here. Is GDP everything? I mean, as New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern pointed out, economic growth is pointless uh, unless uh, people are thriving. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think for, for a long time, there's been critiques of GDP. In fact, when GDP was first created, uh, the intention wasn't for it to be uh, the big target for, for an economy. Some of the issues we do have with GDP today is, one is there's simply a measurement issue. How do you measure the digital economy and what's going on in the digital world uh, in GDP statistics? So there's one just basic uh, error that you have there. Another is that uh, at a very simple level, GDP expansion also means that uh, you are draining the earth of its resources at a very sort of simple level, so it doesn't take into account environmental impact. And then finally, there's an issue around whether GDP equates to well-being and happiness or not. And all of these are uh, problems with GDP, so alternatives do need to be looked at. Um, Rajiv, let's just talk about something we've heard a lot about over the last couple of months, and it's stimulus packages. Do you think we have an addiction to them? Because it seems every time there's a crisis, governments think that they can resolve it by throwing money at the problem. Well, we've now had two massive crises uh, since 2009. Obviously, the global financial crisis, 
when the banking systems in the US and Europe were basically failing and uh, the central banks, the Fed, the ECB and the Bank of England stepped in with massive stimulus measures. Governments also reacted uh, with strong fiscal stimulus. And then, you know, rolling forward another 10 years down the road, here we are with a massive pandemic, global pandemic, and central banks and governments are doing even more, if anything. You know, government stimulus packages uh, across the world are very, very large. And there will be a price to pay for this huge spending. Uh, government debt levels have risen significantly because of this uh, spending by governments. And of course, the uh, expansion of central bank balance sheets eventually has to be unwound. So all of these things will affect the medium to long term outlook for many countries. For some developing countries, the impact may be even more immediate, uh, triggering debt crises and uh, external payment crises in some developing countries. Um, Robert, I want to pick you up on something that you mentioned earlier, and that's about employment or lack of jobs. Why has Europe not seen the same slump in jobs that Asia, Africa and the United States has witnessed, for example? Yeah, sure. I think one of the key things is that obviously Europe has a, has, has a greater safety net. Um, it doesn't have the hire and fire culture. Uh, and, and employment here is more formal than informal. So that's one of the reasons why we've not seen the job losses yet. Um, but obviously sector, sectors are unraveling here, the aviation, uh, manufacturing, tourism. Uh, you're seeing those jobs start, starting to be lost uh, in big numbers. HSBC announced 35,000 job losses. Marks and Spencer's in the UK announced 7,000 job losses. And that's just two examples. Uh, it's difficult to see where those jobs will come back from. I mean, overall, Employment in Europe is 7.5%, but that really masks the fact that in some countries like Spain, it's 14% and it's heading towards 15%. Uh, in Greece, uh, it was, was 14%, it's heading towards 17%. In Italy, it was 9%, it's heading towards 10%. Uh, so employment, unemployment, sorry, is, is increasing at a rate which is greater than the European Commission thought it would be for 2020 and 2021. So if we're already exceeding those levels now, that's a real worry going into the next year. Uh, and if you look at the US and how the US has handled it, I mean, obviously, the US has lost huge amounts of jobs, about 15% of people that are unemployed. And then you've got about another 31 million people who are currently receiving state aid for their work. Uh, yet 47% of Americans who have lost their jobs in the US fear that those jobs are never going to come back. So there's a level of hopelessness. Um, which I just think the UK and, and the EU haven't yet had properly. And as you mentioned at the beginning, the furlough scheme in the UK will end soon. That's nine million jobs. Uh, not all of those jobs are going to remain. So it, it's a huge concern. Uh, and I think Europe has just been able to delay the inevitable and not stop it. Um, Bilal, let's just stick with Britain if we can, because Britain has been the outlier in whichever metric you can think up, worse second quarter GDP, more deaths than anywhere else uh, in Europe. And it's only going to get worse, isn't it? Well, uh, certainly the UK has had uh, one of the worst performances uh, in Europe. The question of whether it will get worse is less clear cut. You know, one is because although uh, many countries are seeing second waves um, and there's some evidence you're seeing some signs of that in the UK, the, the scale of that is not the same as it was uh, three or four months ago. So I think the, the the extent of the COVID crisis in terms of cases and deaths just isn't as extreme as it were, as it was before. Moreover, when we had the full lockdown in the UK, then we saw the most abrupt uh, decline in the economy, and I don't think we'll see such a such a large decline uh, again. Not least because the economy is reopening up, so it's much more you know much more able to for us to see economic activity in the UK. The challenge, though, for the UK is that we also have uh, Brexit coming up as well. So on top of the lingering impacts of the COVID recession, you also have a huge trade shock that is coming down the line. Negotiations so far have not necessarily progressed that much, so the UK is extremely vulnerable. Uh, at this stage uh, in terms of whether it will have a sustainable and fast recovery from here onwards. And that's an important point you make. Let me uh, bring in Rajiv back here, because you look at Britain's handling of the crisis uh, and you look at the strength of the pound. I mean, it does defy logic. I mean, markets just seem to be detached from reality. Oh, so what am I missing, Rajiv? 
Well, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, distortions in what's happening in markets because of the large central bank liquidity flows into the financial system. You know, that is uh, obviously one of the factors behind what's happening with assets. On the other hand, uh, you know, in terms of currencies, you've seen the weaker dollar uh, in recent months. And that's, I think, probably partly due to this uh, situation where confidence in the financial system has declined as central banks have poured liquidity into the system. Uh, so the pound, I think, probably benefits from the weaker dollar, and as has the euro. So it's a question of, uh, you know, which currency is uglier amongst the major reserve currencies right now. Uh, so I think it is a very unclear situation in terms of how asset prices will perform. That's why you've seen gold rallying. That's why uh, you've seen also some of the cryptocurrencies increasing because investors are concerned about the financial system and what the implications are of this huge expansion in bank balance sheets from the Fed, ECB and other central banks, and also the consequences of this huge increase in government debt. Uh, so these are, I think, long-term challenges that are going to be with us long after the pandemic is over. Robert, let's talk about some of the wealthier people and the wealthier corporations. I mean, are billionaires, do you think, a sign of an economic system that's broken? I mean, Jeff Bezos, for example, has seen his wealth rise by $300 billion. Apple uh, has just become the world's biggest company by market value. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it, uh, Darren? I think, you know, like you say, Apple became... Well, Apple's worth $2 trillion uh, dollars now, which is larger than the Italian economy on a GDP basis, uh, which is which is incredible. And I guess you can look at it in two ways. You can say it's a success and that people can become that wealthy, but also a failure because people uh, are so detached from the lives and inequality that exists around the world. So it, it's, it's both. I think, do people need to be worth that much money? No. Uh, is it a problem that companies are that valuable? Uh, yeah, I think when you start becoming bigger than the 10th richest economy in the world, yeah, I think that, that is a strategic issue uh, for countries to, to look at and examine what they can do about that. Um, be, beyond it, it creates political resentment. Uh, and there's some great examples recently in history uh, with the Arab Spring, with the Russian Revolution, with the French Revolution of if, if the people at the top have so much and the people at the bottom have, have nothing, uh, then in time, that will become an issue that people won't be willing to accept any longer. So it's it's also easy to blame rich people uh, for being wealthy. And instead, I think we also need to look at the ways that we distribute assets and finance to people around the world. And we need to look at cheaper homes, uh, better wages, uh, cheaper debt or less debt, uh, and not just think, well, let's just tax the rich people. It's also about how do we improve the lives of, of everyday people. All right, so we've talked about the rich and the poor. Here's a question, gentlemen, that I want to put to all of you, if you can answer briefly for me. Bilal, let me start with you. I mean, we can forget any idea of a V-shaped recovery. So what's your best prognosis, briefly? Well, I think, uh, one, it, it does depend which region of the world. But, but in general, my sense is that we are going to see a... Uh, recovery um, across the world. Um, it will be more shallow. So rather than a V, it could be uh, more like a, a swoosh, like a Nike swoosh. So there will be some recovery. I, you know, I, I don't think that we are going to enter another sort of major recession. So I would say a recovery, not necessarily a complete V shape, but nevertheless, we will we will see a recovery, and it will vary across regions around the world. Yeah, Rajiv, are you seeing any any signs of uh, green shoots of recovery, perhaps? Well, there has been a huge rebound all around the world uh, since June in terms of manufacturing output and also in terms of retail sales. It's not come by anywhere near what it was before the pandemic, but there has been a rebound as lockdowns have been lifted and uh, as factories are allowed to resume production and as stores have reopened and restaurants have reopened. So we have seen some move back towards... Uh, the pre-pandemic levels, but it's still a long way short of um, anywhere like that level at a glo when we look globally. And I think really now the key will be what happens with vaccines and you know how t the economy can rebound after the vaccines have started to be rolled out. 
So at the moment, it does look like 2021 should see a much better performance, a, a reasonably good growth performance next year uh, on the basis that there will be some rollout of vaccines sometime next year. Yeah, Robert, and uh, you painted some fairly grim pictures uh, in terms of the numbers uh, just a bit earlier. So what's your best prognosis then? Yeah, sadly, I'm not as, as bullish as Bilal and uh, Roger. But, I mean, uh, yes, gold's up 30% for the year and US equity markets, the Dow and the S&P are up. But if you look in Europe, the CAC 40, the FTSE 100 and 250 are all down. Uh, gold, yes, is up. Uh, sorry, um, oil is up. But for how long is another question. And I, I really worry um, about the long-term effects. I mean, lots of companies aren't going to make it. You know, 20% decline in profits would, would be the end of them. Uh, with again, you know, a bit like the last recession, we've had huge supply side okay. support, um, but but not enough support for demand. So, you know, there's been loads of money towards banks, loads of money towards loans uh, and business loans, but not enough towards people actually going out and spending money. Let's just move the conversation on uh, to US politics uh, and what's happening there. Uh, Rajiv, let me start with you. I mean, do you think the relationship uh, between the United States and China will change uh, if Joe Biden wins the US election in November? Well, I think that uh, we've seen that you know very strong position at the moment from the U.S. administration today, and that does have support in Congress. So uh, the details and nuances of how the uh, next administration would position if there's a change in administration may be somewhat different. But I think the fundamental position in U.S. Congress is that they do want stronger measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And I, I think at the moment we've uh, seen quite an intensification of the technology war uh, between the U.S. and China with a lot of measures being taken by the U.S. And I think in that area there's likely to be con continuity, I think, regardless of who uh, wins the next election. In the area of trade, where the U.S. has a very large trade deficit with China, I think there there may be more efforts to try to find some sort of okay. solution to okay. boost U.S. exports into the Chinese economy. Robert, just quickly, let me come back to you. So what's the prospect like then for another Trump term? What do you make of his handling of the pandemic? And is he likely to pay a price for that, do you think? Uh, I would say it's 50-50. Um, the Economist puts it at a 13% chance of a Trump win. Um, I, in the key states for Trump, uh, Texas, Georgia, Ohio and Florida, which is now, it's now his home state, uh, he has to turn those and keep those as red. Uh, that's looking by about a 5% margin, uh, give or take, where, where things are at. So it's pretty close. Yeah, it's not, it's not a ton of deal by any stretch of the imagination. Playing golf when you're in the middle of a, a health crisis isn't a great PR. Um, I don't think it's completely Trump's fault. You've got 50 different states with 50 different healthcare systems. Right. Uh, it's not easy when you're the president to, to look after that. In terms of Joe Biden's campaigning, uh, one fear I have is obviously his ability to do rallies, to hold meetings. I mean, how, you, how do you do that during COVID-19? I think it's very difficult. That's clearly going to have some level of impact on the Democrats' ability to campaign. Uh, and Bilal, uh, let's just go back quickly, if we can, on the question of stimulus packages. I mean, does the US need another package to support the recovery? Yes, I, I do think there is a need for another package. It don't, doesn't necessarily need to be as large as, as the first one, but I do think there needs to be some kind of measures, especially on the unemployment side, to extend benefits, perhaps not at the levels that we saw before. But I think there is, is a need for that, uh, just to to ensure that we don't get any large uh, disruptions uh, in the economy. The problem, of course, is that with the election coming up so closely, the incentives for cooperation between the two parties is, is less, uh, which then brings up the specter of President Trump using executive orders to try to okay. bring some kind of stimulus, which, which, it, which uh, in itself is constitutionally quite uh, questionable. Rajiv, let me get uh, a final thought from you uh, to end the chat. I mean, does debt matter anymore? And how will we pay for the pandemic? Do we even need to pay for the pandemic? Debt d definitely does matter, and uh, it depends which country you are. If you're the US or Japan, you have probably a longer runway to deal with the issues of debt. And it also depends who's funding the debt. If you're a developing country and a lot of your 
uh, debt financing is coming from foreign investors, then you are very much uh, at the mercy of sentiment. Okay. And so I think for many developing countries which have increased their debt, they do face tremendous challenges over the medium term outlook. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. We have to leave it there. Thanks for your insight uh, and your analysis. Uh, from London, Bilal Hafiz uh, and Robert Courtley Janeiro. Uh, and from Singapore, Rajiv Biswas. Uh, thank you all for talking to Counting the Cost. Thank you. And that is our show for this week. But remember, you can get in touch with us via Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or you can drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. I'm Darren Jordan from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>